Yes. So welcome, a warm welcome to the first meeting of the Philological Society for this new academic year. Um, I'm sorry we've made it difficult to find us and our location, but well done for getting here. Um, we've been quite active as a society to try and engage, as you know, with the membership, and out of that discussion with members, there are some new initiatives coming through, one of which is in our <coughs> new uh, PhilSOC blog, which has been launched today, um, and I think has had a hundred or so odd hits today, which is good, because it hasn't yet been advertised, so that's, that's very good. So. Please look at the blog. Please think of yourself as being a potential blogger. Um, we're very much looking for, for people to write shortage pieces. Um, and I hope it will make people feel part of, of us um, as uh, um, a society welcoming um, people, whatever stage of their career they are at. Um, we're also, for the first time, um, recording this talk. And um, who would have thought it? The Phil Sock is going to go into having a YouTube channel. Uh, I can't quite get my head around saying those two things in the same sentence. But you know, we've done Twitter, we've done Facebook, now YouTube. Who knows where we'll end? Um, and so again, this is a way of trying to allow people who can't necessarily come to uh, talks in London, Oxford, or Cambridge to nevertheless enjoy the benefits of the excellent speakers that we have. So we are trying to um, respond to some of the membership um, suggestions and if, if you have any other suggestions we always welcome them. The other thing that um, I've been much engaged with over the summer is thinking about the future of the journal um, some of you may know that we have a contract with Wiley and um, there is no reason why that won't continue but uh, as a process of due diligence we are looking at our publishing arrangements and we'll keep the members informed of what we are doing on that front. Okay, so now we'll go to the formal part and the new members. <coughs> Um, our last meeting was the AGM on 11th of June at Wilson College, Oxford, and we had an attendance of 35 members and 5 guests. Um, Bill Kretschmer from the University of Georgia read a paper on the complex adaptive systems English text analysis, lexical grammar, and variation. Um, New, we have a number of new members uh, who joined over the summer. Uh, full members are Professor William Kretschmer, University of Georgia, Eming Kana, Brian Perry, David Petch, Alison Ricketts, the last four no affiliation given. Then we have a number of new student members, Mary Igro, Cambridge, Sabrina Jess Ainsworth, Oxford, Asma Algamdi, Leeds, Yafu and Edinburgh, Fiona Balistriari, Soas, Christopher Cox, York, Monica Gerabias, Liverpool University, Elizabeth Kerr, King's College Cambridge, Sarah Mahmoud, Wilson College Oxford, Jake Michael Sandstead, Edinburgh, and Guardo Baca, Oxford. Um, I should mention that um, after um, the talk today, we will uh, go for a drink uh, to the Tavistock Hotel on Tavistock Square. Um, and following that, at about quarter to seven, we'll go for a meal at China City, 15 Woburn Place uh, near Russell Square. You're all welcome to join us if you want to, to the drink and or the meal. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, please do feel free to come, even if it's only for 20 minutes before you rush in to catch a train. I'm very pleased to see people at the pub and all the dinner. Yes, I should mention as well, oh. there's a book we send around to record who's here. Um, please sign and if you're a guest, just put guest in brackets. Thanks a lot, under ordinary meeting. Um, one final thing, the next meeting on the 11th of November will be at Leeds. 
Um, very welcome. I'm very much to see people there. It's going to be a slightly different event. It's going to be a roundtable discussion with three early career researchers talking about methodological issues. So we hope that that will appeal to a wide range of people, but particularly um, the younger end of our membership. So we hope you'll be able to join us similarly um, at that event. Okay, so that's the, the formal part of the meeting over, and now we get to the bit you've come for, which is um, our speaker today. And I'm very pleased to welcome Rebecca Cliff to give the first talk of this academic year. So Rebecca is Senior Lecturer and Director of Postgraduate Education in the Department of Language and Linguistics at the University of Essex. And before starting at Essex, I think in 1995, she taught um, in Cambridge and at UEA. Uh, as you know, her research particularly focuses on conversation analysis and the relationship between grammar and interaction. Following a PhD on misunderstandings in conversation, she's explored, for instance, how speakers use discourse markers, such as actually or in fact, and how they mark out territories of knowledge through reported speech. More recently, she's published on the subject of how speakers use laughter in the course of reporting speech, which is itself not humorous, and on embodiment in interaction. And her textbook on conversation analysis, I, mean, I can see a, a, a copy um, um, coming out in the, in the CUP red it just series. <laughs> it just appears. Really <laughs> um, there. I was, I was going to say late this year, but it's, 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 just, it's now a couple out, of weeks so old. You yes. can now rush to your local bookstore or to or Amazon bookstore. or whatever your <laughs> favourite book suppliers to get one of the first copies. Now, Rebecca is currently working on indirect utterances and I think is analysing a corpus of video family interaction um, as part of that project. And I think it's some of that work which is going to uh, inform her talk today, um, in, in the subject of which is on the screen there. Is that your coat on the floor? Agency and autonomy in interaction. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, Wendy. It's a terrific honour to be here. Thank you very much. I'm, de I'm delighted to be here. Um, you will need a handout. Um, I've inflicted a handout on you. Um, a, two two double-sided pages, uh, I hope. Pages one to four, which will, um, which you'll need to navigate through the transcripts because I've got some um, video clips that I want to play play you. And so, as have you. Have I turned my microphone on? Um, it seemed to be, yes, on. Are you having trouble hearing me? No, are you okay? And am, am I all right sitting down? Okay, lovely. Thank you. So as Wendy says, um, I'm going today to be reporting some preliminary findings uh, on some work I've been doing on a project I've uh, fairly recently embarked upon on indirection in interaction. <laughs> Um, and I'm interested, as someone who works in conversation analysis, on finding out, trying to establish the interactional motivations uh, for indirection. And what I want to do today is look at a particular group, particular class of actions, directives, whereby someone attempts to get someone else to do something, uh, basically. And that's encapsulated in the title of the talk, uh, which, as you can see, is a yes-no question, and a, and a yes-no question I have uh, cause to uh, pose to my ten-year-old <laughs> on frequent occasions, <laughs> but she knows very well that uh, if she were to answer with either yes or no, uh, she'd probably uh, get sanctioned for cheek. <laughs> so the, 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 the interactional question here is, um, um, why might someone use um, a yes-no question in, instead of an imperative form? pick up your coat. Um, so I want to, to investigate what's generally called the form function conundrum uh, with uh, references when he says primarily it is a corpus of videoed um, family data. And so this is the, the outline uh, of the, the talk basically. Well, I'm firstly going to set out this 
um, problem with something I've only half seriously um, called the Lord Hailsham problem. And those uh, of you of a certain vintage <laughs> will recognize the uh, reference. Uh, if, if you don't, uh, I hope things will become clear in a moment. Um, so, so I'm going to set out the problem uh, to start with. Uh, then I'm going to look very, very briefly at uh, the existing literature and some of the assumptions made in the existing literature. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that literature anyway, so I ne only need to touch on it briefly. And then in the third section, I'm going to look at uh, some little clips of interactional data, uh, which is where the, the transcripts uh, on your handout will, will come um, in. Uh, and I hope that the transcripts, it's, they're transcribed according to, to conversation analytic conventions, so I hope they're not too off-putting. Uh, but uh, the relevant things to remember is, that is, is I've just marked the salient terms in bold uh, with arrows um, in each case. Um, if you see, if you see um, a dot in brackets, so for example, uh, extract one, you're going to break the plant. Uh, at line 24, there's a dot in brackets. It just, just, just means a micropause of less than, less than a tenth of a second. Uh, at lines 40 to 41, you'll see left-hand brackets, square brackets. It just means areas of overlap. Uh, but uh, uh, you, know, you, won't, you won't need uh, t too much detail on that. So, um, so in the, back, back to, to, to the outline, I'm going to look at three directives in, in, in their interactional contexts. Um, and you'll become familiar with, with these, um, uh, I'll, I'll play the clips twice. Um, and uh, they are, uh, number one on the handout, you're going to break the plant that you're leaning against. Uh, uh, number two, uh, someone at the dinner table says, what did she say about talking with your mouth full? <laughs> and the third one, you should be in bed. Okay, so I'm going to look at, ultimately, um, what the implications are for the format of these directives. Um, and I'm going to look at what we've discovered so far in um, interactional studies, um, what we've discovered about responsive behaviour uh, to try and understand the motivation for um, indirectness. So, okay, number one. Uh, as I say, only semi-seriously, what I call the, the Lord Hailsham problem. Uh, and this is, this is my formulation of the central problem in linguistic pragmatics, anyone who's trying to, to, to associate forms to, 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 to functions. Uh, and it's by way of a story told to me by, by a friend of mine who worked um, in the House of Lords. And immediately I heard it, I thought, ah, that's, that's the issue, that's what we're trying to do. It's par apparently true. I mean, it's, it's, it's so delightful, it has to be true. Uh, but it involves uh, this gentleman, uh, who, who th those who recognise him as, as Lord Hailsham, but those of you who don't, uh, he was the Lord Chancellor in uh, Margaret Thatcher's uh, government. I think he died in uh, 2001. Uh, but uh, as you see here, I mean, very important person is, 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 is the message I want to communicate. Uh, head of the judiciary in England and Wales, I think pre presiding officer of the, the House of Lords um, at the time. Anyway, this is a story I was told about him. That there was a, a Conservative MP called Neil Martin, uh, who was the MP for Banbury in Oxfordshire. And he was taking a group of constituents round the Houses of Parliament one day, just a sort of little sightseeing tour. Um, and they were in the central lobby when out of a side corridor appeared Lord Hailsham, looking much like this. <laughs> Terribly grand, he'd been involved in some sort of formal ceremony, and there he was in all his impressive splendour. And Lord Hailsham saw his friend Neil Martin across the corridor, and he said, Neil! <laughs> and everyone <laughs> fell to their feet. <laughs> so this, I see, as the central problem here. How do we associate <laughs> when we hear a linguistic form? Um, it's the central motivating question in interaction. How do we recognize a particular linguistic form as implementing um, a particular action. 
here we clearly got um, something that was intended as a summons that was taken to be um, a directive. And it's, it's hard not to, you know, it's such a delightful case, it's hard not to believe that the, 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 the authority that was visibly embodied in the, in the figure of the Lord Chancellor, who was resplendent in, in, in the pomp of ceremonial dress, was not a resource for interpretation. And it absolutely fits the stereotype of an immensely powerful pe person just issuing directives uh, left, right and centre. So that seems to fit. But, of course, the problem is, uh, I should have given you time to think about this, if you think about perhaps the most uh, famous directive in English history, might be indirect. I don't know if anyone, uh, sorry, I should have given you some time. The most famous directive, or it's certainly the one that popped to my mind when I was thinking about directives in, in, in English history. That's in habit. Oh, well, ah, oh, that's nice. Yes, I was thinking further, further back, actually. And that's, of course, ambiguous. Yes, and, 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 and if, if it, indeed it was uttered, was uh, open to date. I was thinking way back. Anyway, this, this is the one I, I thought of. <laughs> As indirect, which is, of course, uh, uh, slightly problematic for this association of power and... Uh, imperatives. So it's my favourite example of a question uh, clearly taken to be as said murder of um, murder of said turbulent priest uh, attests to be directive. Um, so an equation of power, or so-called deontic authority, um, and directness is is clearly far too simplistic, just stated like that. So how do we start to gain some kind of analytic traction? on this issue of what kind of formats implement uh, what kind of actions. So before we, we get on to that, I just want to uh, give you a little bit of a glimpse of uh, previous literature, some, some of the assumptions, and, and you will, I'm sure, be familiar with, uh, with a lot of this work. The vast literature on indirection, um, but uh, this is, uh, I've taken sort of three pretty random but representative uh, examples of the body of, of literature as a whole. So we've got, for example, Searle's uh, study of indirect speech acts. Um, we've got Brown and Levinson's uh, very um, influential work on and their account of degrees of in, indirection uh, motivated by politeness considerations. And more recently, Stephen Pinker, Novak and Lee have, have talked about the logic of indirectness. Now, all of these accounts um, bring a particular explanatory frameworks, as you can see, to bear on um, the particular forms that these utterances uh, take. And, and all of these accounts are, of course, internally entirely consistent. Um, but those of you who are familiar with them will, will know that all of, what all of them do is, is examine utterances basically in vacuo, I mean, out of their sequential uh, context. Um, and this is pretty problematic if you start to think about how we um, understand utterances uh, in, uh, in context, because we're not just looking at the composition of, a, of an utterance, but we're also looking at, at, at the sequential position an utterance um, uh, occupies in judging what action it is uh, the, the utterance is, is implementing. So, for example, uh, not long ago, I was listening to a, a tape recording of uh, two women talking, and, and, and one was complaining to her neighbour about the fact that she couldn't go out anywhere uh, and leave her seven-year-old son, so she couldn't go, go shopping. Um, and after this detailing, the neighbour came in with, um, just send him round here for a couple of hours. So it's imperative form, just send him round here for a couple of hours. Imperative form delivers a, what was clearly heard as an offer. So, that, so um, if you just take imperative form and assume it, it, it implements a directive, this is uh, problematic. Um, so what can sequential position then bring to the analytic table? Um, and as part of that, what I'm interested in is what can recipients' responsive behaviour tell us about possible motivations, as I say, for uh, indirectness? And, and as a methodological point, um, I'm interested also in, in what video data can bring to our understanding of trajectories of action uh, here. Okay, 
Uh, so this is our three uh, uh, utterances uh, that we're going to be looking at in context. And all of these, as you can see, just like who will rid me of this turbulent priest and is that your coat on the floor, are taken to be directives. You'll see very clearly that uh, they're taken to be directives, but of course they don't have imperative form. They're clearly produced by someone trying to get someone else to do something. And on your um, handouts, you'll see they correspond to the examples I've said, uh, one to three. So in the first instance, uh, if you look at the uh, transcript, um, what you will see, um, a father who is in the middle of a dispute with his teenage daughter, um, makes the observation, she, well, you see it line one, he says, why do we always have to do it the hard way? This is a parenthetical sequence. And at this point, Emily, the daughter, slumps a bit, and then Simon, the father, says, you're going to break the plant that you're leaning against. OK, that's the first one. Uh, in, in number two, we have um, a family at a dinner table. And uh, if you see uh, at line seven, Daisy, who is aged about six or seven, says, when Mrs. Williamson, this is a, this is a teacher, school teacher, when Mrs. Williamson gets it wrong, she goes, and uh, mum, uh, opportunistically, you can see, builds off this reference to Mrs. Williamson. Uh, what did she say about talking with your mouth full? <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's, that's the second directive. And the third directive on page three, uh, number three, um, uh, uh, you'll see a young teenage boy uh, enter the living room where his older sister is watching television. And uh, whereupon she says at line nine, you should be in bed. So those are the three um, uh, examples we, we are going to look at. So let's start to look at uh, some of these um, in uh, context now. Um, I'm just going to play all three so you'll get a sense of what they're like together. Then we'll, we'll look at them each one by one. OK. So this is uh, taken from a corpus I'm working with now. Uh, might be familiar to some of you. Um, this was broadcast uh, on Channel 4 some years ago. <laughs> some, some, some people are looking recognitionally at it. Um, under the, series, the, the, the title The Family. So um, a television company uh, filmed a British family in their home for 100 days non-stop. So it's like Badger Watch, but with Homo sapiens, basically. Um, and it was, it was edited down um, for broadcast to, to nine hours. You see um, between, on the wall between the father and the teenage daughter, you can see a, one of the cameras there. Um, so um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, fa it's fantastic data. And I, I was lucky enough to... to secure some of the raw footage from, so this is the first series, but the second series I'm, I'm, I'm working on. This is, unfortunately, it's edited, but, but this bit is um, uh, as, uh, as complete as it can be. There, are, there aren't too many cutaways. Um, so uh, what you see is mother, Jane, on the left, uh, father, Simon, and Emily, uh, who is 19 years old in what I would characterise as a rather fissile environment. Um, Emily's just been told off by her uh, parents uh, misbehaving in, in ways we don't need to bother us. Uh, so there's been a bit of a ding-dong between the parents and the daughter. And there's this parenthetical sequence in the middle of it where you'll see Simon say, and this is on line um, 18 on the transcript, uh, first, first uh, uh, excerpt, why do we always have to do it the a uh, hard way. Uh, Emily then slumps, um, and what you see, is, it's not uh, terrifically clear, it'll become clear, I hope, when it's um, moving. Do you see the pink thing behind Emily? That's actually um, an orchid in a pot, um, and she slumps onto that. Um, and uh, so, so you'll see what happens. Um, and at the end of this, right at the end of this sequence, this is, finishes at um, uh, line 68, you'll see it's interrupted, as so many conversations are these days, by a mobile phone going off. <laughs> so um, anyway, this, this, this is it in toto. Why do we always have to do it the hard way? 
You're going to play the plant that you're leaning against. What? Or not? You're not leaning against it, but you are. I mean, so it's really... Because you are leaning against it. Don't start with me. Don't start with me. Don't start with me. Don't start being aggressive towards me, Emily. Thank you. I'm laughing because you're saying you're not leaning against it when you clearly are. Em. Okay. <laughs> Familiar sound. <laughs> Um, okay, that's the first one, just to familiarise yourself with, with what's going on and the, the dramatis persona here. Um, number two, um, this, is, this has been anonymised. It was, it was um, recorded for um, a PhD, a terrific PhD by Alexandra Kent, who did her work on um, children's compliance with parental directives. Uh, so, of course, um, <laughs> or not, um, as the case may be. Um, and because it wasn't filmed for public consumption, it's all been uh, uh, anonymised. But I hope you will be able to make out what you'll see when they move. Um, mother, stage left here. Daisy on the right. Uh, next to Daisy, to Daisy's right, is father um, and a, a middle child, Lucy, who, they're, they're, they're not really relevant. The, the exchange of interest is between uh, mother um, and uh, Daisy. So what you'll see is, um, as I've said, uh, Daisy saying, um, oh, you'll hear, hear the name blanked out of the, of the, of the footage. Um, when... Mrs. Williamson or whoever gets it wrong, uh, she goes, uh, and before she finishes, mum op opportunistically, as I said, builds her directive onto that. Uh, what did she say about talking with your mouth for? And you, can, you can just see immediately. This, you, you could never imagine <laughs> a, a directive like that. We have to work, you know, make them up. Uh, this is this is one that's just done absolutely opportunistically. So uh, here it is. Yes. Don't just play with it. I said you can. Okay, <laughs> that's another one. <laughs> Not going to look at that one. Okay, right, the third one. Third one is taken from the same family as as you saw in number one, uh, and it involves a uh, fourteen-year-old Tom here who is, you'll see, he's in his dressing gown and he's walking towards the living room where his sister, Emily, uh, is seated. Uh, parents are out of the house. Emily's watching television. Um, and you'll see uh, uh, Tom approaching the living room, produces a summons to Emily, so that is um, uh, M... Um, Sorry, yes, uh, 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 example three, and it's uh, line three, M. Um, and in response, uh, you'll see uh, Emily produces her directive. Uh, you should be in bed. Okay. So we go. Yeah, that's the What? Yeah, go to bed. Okay, so that's that's the three. Uh, so let's just look at the three instances um, together initially. Now, one of the what the clearest things that the format um, uh, makes uh, obvious. Uh, is, 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 is what they next make relevant, as a relevant next action. So what the, the Lord Hailsham Neal example uh, suggests um, is, is, is that it got immediate compliance. Um, everyone fell to the floor, if you believe it. <laughs> um, and in conversation analytic terms, it's, it's what's called the preferred response. And, and, and uh, uh, th th that's not a, a conversation analysis has this, is this term preference, which re really doesn't confusingly index psychological dispositions, but, but, it, but it indexes a sort of empirical skewing. Um, that, that, that's, uh, that's what happens uh, most often. So there's a, this a, a tested empirical skewing towards this form of response, and it comes very fast. Neil, bang. Um, 
s but if you look at um, these, the, the format of these three, um, what, what they make relevant is not, of course, uh, 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 initially uh, something uh, uh, compliant or not obviously. Um, but what you can see when you look at the um, uh, transcript of, for example, number one, is that Simon's observation, you're going to break the plant that you're leaning against, which is in declarative format, makes it possible for Emily to dispute whether she is or is not leaning against the plant. Um, so when we play this, when I play this again, you might like to look in the wake of Emily's response, I'm not at uh, 28, you might like to look at um, Jane, the mother's response to that. She does a sort of snorted laugh. You see, she, she shifts her posture and goes... <laughs> it's a sort of snort that I can't quite, <laughs> quite replicate. Um, uh, it, but it obviously ridicules Emily's assertion that she's not uh, leaning against the pl plant. And I, I, I don't know if I put, put it down here. But uh, yes, I, I just... Uh, uh, Wrote, wrote a paper that came out in Journal Pragmatics called Don't Make Me Laugh. It's, it's about laugh responses to serious turns, things that are designed as serious. And of course, Emily's assertion, I'm not, is, is ostensibly serious, but it gets a snort of derision from, from Jane. Um, uh, so, uh, but you'll see in the wake of the directive, you're going to break the plant. Uh, the talk is concerned with the validity of Emily's um, um, uh, claim and in fact you'll see that on a pragmatic on a practical level the directive is actually successful because she leans you know she she, she veers away from the, the the plant so let's let's look at this again you might like to as i say look at jane's snort in the wake of emily one member have to do it the hard way you're going to break the plant that you're leaning against or not you're not leaning against it, but you are. I mean, so it's really... Well, because you are leaning... It's not there, Don't start with me. Don't start with me. Don't start being aggressive towards me, Emily. Thank you. I'm laughing because you're saying you're not leaning against it when you clearly are. Em. Okay. Right. So, coming back to our, our three... Um, you can see that the format of all three does not um, at least explicitly make compliance relevant. They, at least on the surface, make something else uh, relevant. Uh, so what did she say about talking with your mouth full? Ostensibly uh, is a question about the teacher. Now I'll play the, se the next clip again, but what I'd like you to look at, please, is um, Daisy's behaviour in the wake of the directive. Uh, and I'm just going to, if you'd like to look at the, um, the handout here, this sort of tries to um, uh, uh, register what, what happens after um, mum says at line 12 to 13, what did she say about talking with your mouth full? For a start, there's a significant delay uh, of uh, 1.3 seconds. Um, but then Daisy does at line um, 15, um, she does what Alex Kent, who collected this data and wrote about it, calls a crafted over-exaggeration. She holds herself ramrod straight um, and she chews energetically. You'll, you, I think, think you'll be able to see this. And she, then she announces, I've finished, when she visibly has food still in her mouth. <laughs> Um, so there's this co public contradiction here, which, which um, serves to defy that directive by claiming but not demonstrating uh, compliance uh, uh, with it. Um, and finally, at line uh, 18, we get the swallow. <laughs> We get Daisy, uh, you know, in a very elaborate non-verbal display, cranes her head back and swallows, and so she finally complies. But but the thing to note here is the compliance is at some distance from the directive, uh, and you'll see finally that Mum and Dad separately register Daisy's action. Uh, Mum with a shake of the head and Dad with um, a dismissive laugh, and then the uh, action moves on, they turn their attention elsewhere. So you might like to look out for Daisy's initial response, this elaborate performance of chewing, 
that demonstrates a stance of compliance while not actually delivering it. And so the compliance is delivered at some, some remove from the directive. Just play with it. I said you can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Let's. Um, so that we've got we've got delay and delayed compliance um, there. Let's look at now at what Tom does uh, with Emily. Uh, if we look at the um, the handout, uh, top of page three, um, we've initially got. Um, well, after in the wake of the directive, again we've got. Um, uh, delay, you should be in bed, but then immediate resistance, uh, I've got till 10, and subsequently, what's up with you? Um, and you'll see, um, it's at th uh, 35, we have an upgraded directive in imperative form. Yeah, go to bed. So it, it's the imperative form here um, that uh, 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 is produced after initial um, resistance, um, so that the, the, the indirect form is resisted and then we get the direct form. And what's interesting about seeing sequences of action like this is you, you can see the relationship of direct to indirect utterances. Um, so let's, let's just see what, uh, what happens after um, uh, line 35, the resistance. So go to bed, we get the turn and the walk away. So it looks like compliance. What is interesting is that actually he walks into the kitchen to the fridge. So again, it looks like compliance, but it is not. Um, uh, so what, what is this compliance? What, what, what is this apparent compliance? Um, now, Alex Kent, um, and her work, as, as um, exemplified in Daisy's response to, to, to her mum, identified this kind of behavior, where you look as if you're complying, but, but uh, aren't really. Uh, is something she calls incipient compliance. Um, so it's this mid-course between immediate compliance and resistance. Now what I'm finding in the examples I'm looking at in, the, in the, the, these, these fragments is recurrently what we have is um, a significant delay, as you've seen in, in, in these cases, um, between the, the directive um, and the compliance. And um, uh, often sign, signs uh, that, uh, that, that, the, that there is, there is uh, going to be compliance, but, but not yet. So, so what's this delay about? Uh, and, and again, as I said, I, I, I find this a pretty recurrent phenomenon. In fact, a, a while back, I saw exactly this on a train. I, was, I, I, I got on a train, uh, got into conversation with an elderly lady next to me, and, and it dawned on us that, that across the aisle uh, there were some fairly boisterous teenage boys and they plonked their shoes on, on the seats opposite. Um, and as I plonked their shoes, there was, there was me thinking, um, uh, being a f rather feeble and timid creature, I was thinking, maybe I should say something, <laughs> uh, not knowing quite how to formulate this. Um, but the, the lady next to me had no such qualms, I sort of <coughs> dived in and said, you should get your feet off the seats. Um, and so immediately in there she was. And um, the boys opposite snarled at her. You know, there was all sorts of stuff came back, uh, which I won't repeat. Um, uh, and so we just sort of let it go and, and both continued what we, what we were doing. A minute later, their feet were off the seats. Okay, so we had a prime example there. I thought, oh, delayed compliance. <laughs> uh, so what's going on here? Um, what what um, uh, 
uh, Alex Kent suggests is that b by delaying your response um, uh, and perhaps showing signs of incipient compliance in some cases, but not all, but in d delaying your response, um, participants' behaviour comes across <coughs> as self-motivated rather than just purely responsive, uh, not responding to the directive as such. Um, so in Daisy's case, as you can see, if you remember back to the Daisy case, an upgraded repeat directive is held off by dem demonstrating a compliant orientation but without delivering compliance as such. But, so when compliance is ultimately delivered, when Daisy swallows and you know, um, uh, com complies, it's produced as if the action is, is done under the child's own auspices, indeed almost voluntarily. Um, and, and so what Kent shows is that um, recipients of directives resolve this core dilemma, that compliance means relinquishing uh, your autonomy and submitting to the speaker's will. And, and so, 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 so that's, that's, a, that's a problem, um, but resistance risks prompting a, a further upgraded attempt uh, at control. Um, and in fact, um, what happened in this particular case with Tom uh, was the situation escalated. Uh, There's a very long sequence, so I won't play it here. Uh, but, but here we have to Tom turns, he goes to the kitchen for, to the fridge. I don't know if you can see him, he's over um, Emily's right shoulder. Uh, and, and the next bit is Emily, uh, she doesn't say anything, she just bed. <laughs> She just does that. Th then he eventually goes up. Uh, there's a fight. Um, and uh, there's a physical fight. And Emily gets terribly, uh, she gets hurt. So, so you see the whole trajectory of action from you know, that initial, um, you should be in bed. Things escalate. Um, uh, but it's, it's really interesting that that started with just you know, this, this, this fairly um, low key, you know, uh, you should be in bed. So anyway, to go back to questions of compliance and incipient compliance, uh, we learn from incipient compliance, this middle ground between compliance and resistance, that firstly it's successful in heading off um, uh, a reissue directive, but also, and this is absolutely crucial, this is going to be absolutely critical to, to the argument here, and our understanding of indirectness, uh, that the principle of recipient autonomy and voluntarism is very important to people. And this is where, as I say, the rubber really hits the road. Um, I'd like to look very briefly at some recent work in conversation analysis that all seems to point um, in the same direction to the importance for speakers of autonomy independence and exercising agency, under, uh, doing things under one's own auspices, not anyone else's. Uh, and you can see from, from Daisy's behaviour, for example, how, how early that um, starts. Um, and uh, the first uh, uh, point here is um, uh, some absolutely pioneering work in, in CA at least uh, by uh, John Heritage and Jeff Raymond on what they um, call uh, epistemic uh, rights. Um, and for those of you, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, but um, just, just to very briefly explain um, uh, what, what, they've, what they've shown is um, that if you have something like um, uh, what's called an assessment or an evaluation, like it's a nice day, um, if, if you hear something like that, uh, and in the position of, say, wanting to agree with it, you can do a number of things um, in, in second position it, to, to do that agreement. And, and one way of doing it is just to say, yes, it is, it's lovely. Okay? Um, but you could choose to do that agreement in another sort of way. Uh, instead of saying, yes, it is, um, it's lovely, you could decide um, to say, it is, yes. And it turns out, one of the things that Heritage and Raymond discovered, that there's this vast difference in interaction, in English interaction, between yes it is 
and it is yes. Because what it is yes does is not just so much, so much an agreement, but a confirmation. And by saying it is yes, what you're really doing is saying, um, I had that, I came to that assessment first. Um, and there are a number of things you can do in the second position, um, in, in, in second position, in the second position places, um, which suggest I, I came to that idea first. Um, so, um, for example, uh, and it's what they call, uh, what Heritage and Raymond called second position up epistemic upgrading. There are a number of grammatical things you can do to say, I got there first. One, one is, as I've said, uh, confirmation plus agreement. It is, yes. Um, to do O prefacing before a second, and assess second assessment uh, seems to do the same thing. It's a lovely day. Oh, it's gorgeous. D does that. Uh, tag questions. Um, it is, isn't it? Because what you're doing is then pushing, it, pushing back onto the other person. Uh, say, agree with me. <laughs> it's all who's getting there first. And negative interrogatives. Isn't it? Lovely. So this, this, the, the, these mechanisms are extremely powerful and they work totally below, I think, level of consciousness. I had a very interesting experience with, with Gail Jefferson, who uh, be familiar to, to some of you as one of the uh, ancestral figures in conversation analysis. When this first came out, I was terribly excited about it. And I, was I was talking to her and she didn't believe it at all. Um, and we were walking, there was a group of us walking down in, in South London past, past um, a very nice house, sort of half timber style house. And, and Gail said to the person she was with, uh, that's a lovely house. And he said, it is, isn't it? And um, being a conversation analyst, <laughs> she turned to me and said, Rebecca, Rebecca, Paul's just said, it is, isn't it? Not, yes, it is. So what, you know, but we're just walking past this house for the first time. What, you know, what do you make of that? And then what Paul said was fascinating. He said, you know what? I walk past this house every day on my way to work. So what I was indexing totally subconsciously was, I have that impression first, okay? So what you find and what Heritage and Raymond found um, was that um, who, who gets there first, who comes to an assessment first is a real priority issue for participants. Um, and even in the apparently benign environment of agreement uh, and consensus, there can be some real competition over epistemic rights. We can see some, some almost, you know, this is, it is, yes, yes, oh, it is. Um, you, you, can, you can see the sort of argy-bargy going on uh, when two people are ostensibly um, agreeing. So that's a very important domain of work for showing how autonomy and independence in particular positions, interactual positions, matter to people. Um, here's another very recent uh, stream of work by Coben Kendrick and, and, and Paul Drew. Uh, it came out this, this year uh, um, in the uh, journal Research on Language and Social Interaction. So here, um, Kendrick and Drew identify a class of actions which they call recruitments. Um, and, and they use this term to encompass uh, all sorts of ways, both linguistic and embodied, uh, in which people either seek assistance from others or um, in which uh, ways in which we come to perceive another's need for um, uh, assistance and offer or volunteer uh, uh, assistance. So, so it's a whole class of actions which encompasses um, explicit requests uh, to practices that elicit offers to, or to anticipations of need. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wide class. So obviously if I'm, I'm, you and I are walking to, to, towards a door and I've got a cup of tea in each hand, I might look at you uh, to recruit um, uh, your, your help with opening the door. And actually in that context you can imagine that uh, me having to request assistance with opening the door is probably sort of interactional incompetence <laughs> if you haven't already perceived my need, need for help uh, to start with. Um, so um, Kendrick and Drew, I've just uh, uh, lifted a, a nice, nice quote um, from, from their, their work. So they say that while a recipient who grants a request submits to the agency of the requester, agreeing to implement a solution devised by the requester, the recipient of a report or display of a problem finds him or herself in a position to offer assistance voluntarily and to determine his or 
her own solution to the problem, thereby exercising a greater degree of agency over the course of action. So we've got agency here entering um, uh, the picture. So as they suggest, of course, or, um, offering assistance voluntarily rather than having it coerced uh, from you is always going to be, in interactional uh, terms, uh, preferable. So we've got work in these two domains, epistemic rights and uh, recruitments, uh, on different classes of actions, is identifying autonomy as this, this critical component of agency. And crucially here, that the first position slot in interaction, whether a request um, or directive, is the default one. First position is the default for the exercise of agency. And that we can do things in second position to, to try and override that, that, that default. Uh, but I also want to show, in the, in the last bit of your handout, um, how we can find evidence in particular linguistic practices um, uh, that, that, that people can sort of fight back in second position, as it were. Um, people can push back against the, the first position agency in order to assert uh, more auto autonomy. So this is um, uh, the first one. And this is, uh, sorry, this this is, uh, top of page uh, uh, four here. Uh, the first uh, bit of work I want to introduce here is by Stephen Clayman on turn initial um, terms of um, address. Um, so what you have here is, uh, this is a phone recording uh, by between Fred and Laurie, um, where you can see Fred is really flagging up a request very, very uh, prominently. Oh, by the way, I have a big favour to ask you. Right? <laughs> it's there in line one. Sure, go ahead. Remember the blouse you made a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. And then at line five, six, we've got a recruitment. Well, I want to wear it this weekend to Vegas, but my mum's buttonholer is broken. Okay? So that's not a request. What, what is? It's, it's, it's you know, a prime example of this kind of um, recruitment. So by line six, Laurie is in a, a quite a difficult position because this request has been flagged up so um, prominently. There's what we call you know, pre-sequence at the beginning. I have a big favour to ask you. Um, the, so the problem that Laurie has by the end of all this flagging up is that a preemptive offer is vulnerable to be heard as just sort of going along with um, uh, uh, what's going to be uh, asked, sort of almost coerced. She's almost coerced into um, uh, 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 producing the, the offer, and not, so not genuine. That's, I think that's her, that's her dilemma. And what Clayman argues is that the framing of the offer in line seven um, is geared to working around that eventuality. And it's the turn initial term of address, Fred, <laughs> which um, is, is part of that working around, um, that, that, that um, sense or that I'm, I'm just going along with what you've already flagged up and the offer's just been sort of pulled out of me. Um, and, and what Clayman says is, and I'm going to quote him here, the prefatory address term foreshadows and underscores the independent and thus voluntary nature of the offer in progress. While the subsequent account, I told you when I made the blouse I'd do the buttonholes, um, invokes a motivational history um, for the offer that predates the present sequential environment. Um, all of this casts the action in progress as a non-coerced and fully volitional offer, with the further consequence of implying that the request was unnecessary. Fred, I told you when I made the blouse I'd do the buttonhole. So that's the work that the, the turn initial term of address um, uh, is doing there. Okay, so that's one bit of um, work, uh, uh, Clayman's work, which shows a, a little linguistic resource, turn initial term of address, that in second position pushes back against this sense that, you know, this, is, this offer's just been coerced for me. This is something that, um, uh, the next bit of work is something that I want to report that I've been working on in a sort of just preliminary uh, fashion, um, on pronouns, or perhaps lack of them. Uh, uh, so, this, so this is from, 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 from the domain of, of, of reference uh, and uh, pronoun use, or lack of pronoun use. Um, 
it's long been known, of course, that, that um, anaphoric reference does did not require antecedents necessarily, so from Lasnik's uh, work in the, in, in the, in the 70s onwards. Um, uh, in, interactually, there's, there, was a, there was a rather poignant um, observation by Shegloff on, on one particular usage on the day that Kennedy was shot in Dallas. Um, there was um, an interval uh, when, uh, after Kennedy had been shot, no one knew whether or not he had survived. Uh, and he remarked that uh, that day, when people knew he'd been shot, uh, at the campus, uh, on the campus at UCLA, um, he witnessed um, people walking up to complete strangers uh, on the campus and saying, do you know if he's still alive? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that pronoun that's used, as a, 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 what might be called a subsequent object it was used in an initial position to, to do some bit of interaction work. Um, Shegloff's comment or observation was, in that use of that um, pronoun lay community, um, a more, um, uh, perhaps more s certainly uh, uh, salient, but certainly more recent um, instances, I don't know if you remember when Saddam Hussein was captured in Baghdad, Paul Bremer, the, the American envoy, uh, uh, opened his press conference by saying, Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Um, and again, there's that, that pronoun uh, used use there uh, in initial uh, uh, position um, to, to do a particular bit of, of work. Now, I'm looking, what I'm interested in, is the inverse. I'm looking at where pronouns aren't used, where they could be. Um, so what we've got here is um, Adam uh, is a guest in Vanessa's house, and uh, he's helping with pre-dinner drinks. Um, and uh, he says, shall I get some, I don't know where the ice is actually, <laughs> I just realised it's an online realisation, shall I get some, I don't know where the ice is actually. So, and Vanessa says, oh I'll get the ice. So my analytic question started from the point, was, why does she say the ice here, where she could so easily have said, I'll get it. And, and, and um, what I'm seeing I mean, this is just a representative uh, case, but um, is, is people use these initial forms in a subsequent position to do this bit of interactional work, which is pushing back against the, the secondness of their position, as it were, and folded into that. I don't want to get, you know, to stray too far, but, but of course you can see that there's a, 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 an awful lot of identity work going on in there with, with hostness and guestness and, you know, I should have been there first, perhaps, with, with the eyes. Um, so that's just um, some, some work that I'm doing at, at, at the moment that, 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 does, that, that fits into um, looking at um, uh, the, 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 the motivations for, for, for indirectness. Um, but I think we've got a bit of evidence that um, by using this full form, uh, uh, she's making, Vanessa's making this claim to be building an initial rather than a subsequent action. Uh, again, is asserting the independence of what she's, she's about to do from the prior turn, sort of disengaging uh, uh, from it in a sense. So, to sum up, I think there's growing evidence from recipients' behaviour uh, that autonomy and independence uh, matter to people in interaction. And so the pe to come back to, is that your coat on the floor, which is where we started, I, uh, um, uh, my sense from this, this evidence is that the parent who issues, is that your coat on the floor, instead of pick it up, um, as a directive, is yielding something in autonomy uh, to the child, uh, who by picking it up is effectively, of course, short-circuiting the, the directive that, that, it, that it foreshadows. Um, and I want to end, um, uh, finally, on um, uh, this uh, uh, quote uh, from uh, a philosopher, observation by, uh, by uh, John Doris, a philosopher, because I think, I think this sort of work um, uh, uh, deals with um, deontic authority, uh, uh, really. We're looking at deontic authority. And, 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 and who... In, in Alex Kent's words, who prevails in decision making? And of course, in, 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 in um, you know, on the macro level, uh, 
uh, when, when we think of the Brexit arguments, who prevails in decision making was certainly something that, 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 uh, that some people raised to, to, to a front and centre issue. Um, but, th but this, is, this is the concern here. Um, so um, anyway, Doris, when he's talking about um, indirect utterances, uh, talks of, in terms of securing one's own values. So when, when I was thinking about you know, how, you, how you raise children, for example, this is particular, particularly salient. And, and so Doris says, much human agency is characterized by indirection, achieving outcomes that are not amenable to direct volitional control, but are manipulable by causal intermediaries. Securing the expression of one's values and thereby exercising agency frequently requires workarounds. And so what I hope to have done today is give you some sense of how some of these workarounds are embodied in actual moments of interaction. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, both for a very interesting talk. It was a very entertaining <laughs> talk. As a parent, I'm sure I'll <laughs> recognise things. I couldn't help thinking about the one in the third interchange where Emily says good night. Which I can remember saying to Mike, can I have a biscuit? Good night. Can I have a drink? Good night. Which is actually another one of these, you know, go to bed. It's so, quite... so, you know, it's brought back, um, brought back memories. Yes, it's very recognisable all of this yes. stuff, isn't it? Yes. So I'm sure there are questions. There are comments. questions I'd be happy to try and address them. Any comments? Yes. Uh, yes, Cla sorry, Klaus, I said, yeah. You mentioned delayed compliance. Yes. Um, to make a non-linguistic remark, isn't all education uh, of teenagers <laughs> about delayed compliance? <laughs> so, so for like you, you look at what they might be as adults, you remember back that perhaps you heeded words 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and if, if you're really lucky, they will recognise where the origins were. But I'm sure, yes. It would be interesting to see if there's anything. I mean, obviously, the Hailstrom one is a dramatic example where there's ever immediate compliance, especially to something like, um, you know, a, 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 an imperative, you know, mm -hmm. good night, or oh, go to bed. Yeah, sorry, pass. On your slide 25, could you put... Uh, 25, okay. Yeah. So you're wondering now, why does Vanessa uh, say, I'll get the ice? Yes, in? yes. Uh, but what if um, the next turn had been, uh, she could have said next, yeah. you get the beer, in which case she would have said a con set up a contrast between ice and beer, and it would have had nothing to do with grabbing back the autonomy, would it? No. <laughs> what, no, what? no, I'm not. I'm, uh, I suppose my, my answer to that is I'd like to see an example where she does. So, so um, uh, you know, there, there, there might be a case where she, where she does, but in this, in this world, um, and in the, in the cases where I'm, I'm, uh, that I'm looking at, I, I'm looking at those cases where, where clearly there's something going on with the use of the full form. But that, that in a sense, is to sidestep your, your question. But yes, I'm, 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 I'm sure there are the cases where... Uh, another quick question. Hmm. You don't mention the concept of losing face, but yeah. the, the whole thing is linked up to that. Absolutely. It? Ultimately, I, th I think that's the consideration. Where I'm starting is trying to find those li linguistic um, resources that people use, and I'm sure faces, face comes into it. And of course, autonomy, negative face, it all fits. But that's not where I wanted to start, I suppose. I wanted to start in the detail of, you know, uh, why the ice, why not it? Uh, which, which is, uh, there's this lovely quote that, that, that Levinson uh, has about. Um, uh, all, all, ling uh, all linguistics tries to find generalizations. Um, you know, uh, all science tries to find generalizations, but 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 you need empirical bite. And I suppose what I'm trying to find is an empirical bite here. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I, you know, the final quotation begins with much human agency which suggests you're dealing with the universal which goes into other languages. Mm. And I, I, I was reacting, I'd never met this before, but I'm from a bilingual herd household. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not persuaded that it works quite as we describe, although 
if you're with a language which is heavily inflected, or mm. English is not inflected, mm. or for all purposes, but then there are other resources. Yeah. Um, but do you know studies in other languages which confirm what you're claiming for English? Um, well, yes, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of work on um, the, the epistemic <coughs> work, for example, in, increasing um, a number of studies showing s similar things, different resources, of course, um, uh, but in, in Japanese and in Finnish and um, uh, uh, um, some sub Saharan uh, languages, for example. Um, so uh, of course, if your language doesn't have a particular resource like tag questions or, or O, <laughs> um, but in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a, the, a Mandarin particle that exactly, works exactly like O in, 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 in these cases. Uh, but I would, yes, I would say that in, in other la some other languages might not have those same resources. There's a, there's a, there's a language um, uh, called Chapala in Ecuador that doesn't seem to have these uh, it's known, known in, in CA as pre-sequences, so um, uh, I have a big favour to ask you, um, or um, uh, something like, have you got 10 minutes, or um, uh, you know, uh, any, any of these things. The, the other day I was going into campus and I saw some, a friend walking past and I said, um, I was just getting into my car, I said, are you, are you going to campus, Les? And he said, um, Yes, I am, but I'm fine, thanks. I mean, he clearly heard that as, as a, a pre-offer, pre-invitation. Um, so those pre-sequences, in Trapala, they don't exist, apparently. Um, so um, you, get, you, you, you get absolute directness. You get, give me your canoe. <laughs> you know, uh, or, or pass me the soap. Um, so, uh, but that, the, the, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the, the work of Steve Levinson, the MPI, across a whole lot of languages, so this comparative study of maybe 20 languages. Chapala is the only language so far that, we, we, that, that they've, they've uh, established that there's no such thing as those sorts of pre-sequences. So you use the resources of your language to do the different things, I'm sure. Yeah. Somewhat similar, also looking from the perspective of North Indian culture, right. which is where I right. lived and where my work is based. So this, sorry. sorry, yeah, thinking about North Indian culture, oh, yeah. where I lived. Um, so this example where Fred is asserting his autonomy, was I think the word you used? Uh, well, I was thinking of Laurie. Uh, sorry, Laurie. Laurie yeah, in second position. That he was always going to do the, yes. the buttonholes. Um, I can't imagine this type of situation coming up in certain relationships. Um, particularly, I'm thinking of very close friendships where there's an understanding that your friend will, of course, do any job that you ask them to do. Mm -hmm. um, and also when a senior person asks a junior person or tells them to do anything. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, I think there just isn't a need right. um, culturally for that kind of autonomy. Mm. Um, so I can't imagine that my um, close friends would ever need to make it seem like they thought of it first. Right. I ask yeah. them to do something and they do it. And yeah. That's just how it works. Yeah. So, so that's all, uh, the, fa the face work that was raised earlier. I mean, I think the, the content, I suppose, of face um, is, is different in different cultures. It doesn't work. That you can't, yeah. But interestingly, they, um, we do use um, a pre, did you call it pre-sequence? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, if I called my friend it mm -hmm. which could be translated as uh, there's a piece of work right and um, and she would say but I yeah, please speak or please tell okay so sh she knows something's so coming if up I say yeah. there's a piece of work yeah and she's very clear that it's for her right yeah uh, that's, uh, that's really interesting. interesting that's really interesting yes um, and another one similarly um, and it depends on the relationship you have, but I mm. could call, um, I could call uh, somebody and say, what are you doing right now? Are you busy? Mm. And they wouldn't answer yes or no, depending on the relationship we had. They would say, please tell me. Mm. And they understand I'm asking, are you busy? Because I've got a job for them. Mm -hmm. mm. So, yeah. It's yeah, no, it's very interesting how, yeah, the... the I suppose the linguistic resources of each language then enable you to do 
different things in your relationship. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about, I mentioned identity briefly in relation to the host-guest relationship, um, but an, an, another thing that, that your comment um, prompted me to think about was um, how, when you go to that second position, um, epistemic upgrading, you can, um, you can sort of tell, if you just overheard people, you, 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 could, you could hear in what they were doing uh, things like host-guest relationships. I, I remember coming out of a pub with a friend. She'd, she'd recommended the, the pub. We had a lovely meal and I said, that, this is a lovely place. And she said, it is, isn't it? Now anyone overhearing us could have told immediately who was host and who was guest. So you're sort of doing your relationship in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, use of your resources and which, which way you decide to say either yes it is or it is, isn't it, or whatever. So yeah, thank you, that's really interesting. On the same, the same yeah. slide there, yeah. if uh, I can in very easily imagine me saying yes it is, isn't it? Mm. Which way does that go? Then? Well, because I think I, you've, I, you've, 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 you've registered your initial yes. <laughs> so that takes precedence. Uh, so, sorry? That, that takes precedence over... Well, I, yes, it is. It? It is well, it? there's also, of course, you've got different resources, haven't you? You've got, you've, you've, you've got uh, you could mention prosodic um, uh, uh, resources as well, that's factored into that. But I think the fact that you've done yes um, indicates that, that you're really doing an agreement else. you're doing an agreement first the thing is what's a priority what do you put at the beginning of the turn and if you decide to jettison the yes in favor of it is i think you're doing something very strongly strongly there um, but but if you're doing the yes i mean heritage and um, raymond say that the, the, the yes turn initially uh, would do <coughs> the agreement um, and you might be doing a little bit of <laughs> juggling around at the end, isn't it? Um, but uh, it, 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 stuff that's done at the beginning is, 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 is really telling, I think. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Yes, just a little point. I was puzzled about Fred and Laurie. What, what oh, sorry. sex they were. Oh, oh, oh I, th I think, I think Laurie, Laurie is female. And Fred? Male. I mean, it it's sounds male, but a blouse? I mean, I can't... Oh, I don't, well, well, maybe. I, I, you know, I don't... I, it's, I sort of wasn't really tracking gender there, but yeah, yeah. No, blouse is not a shirt. Sorry? Blouse is not a shirt in no. that. Well, what does it mean then? It kind of like oh, they're American. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I assumed it was a cultural kind of yeah. convention I wasn't familiar with. I just, Sh Shegloff never looked at uh, British data because they had a different language. Just couldn't understand what was going on. This is a language I don't understand. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peter. Oh, sorry, Peter, yes. Oh, so this is a very minor point. <coughs> so long an example of it is, isn't it? Yeah. Which I'm doing with a neutral intonation. <laughs> um, so called. Um, I wonder if, I mean, you, th this isn't essential to your argument yeah. at all, but the, the work you cited, which I haven't read, mm. seemed to be trying to relate this use of this form to the specific formal structure of right. a tag question. Right. And I wonder if this isn't possibly an over an over sophisticated analysis. Right. Based on a particular use of it. Because I mean I could say for example, now if I have the intonation, um, it is, isn't it? Hmm. I could say that in all sorts of circumstances. I mean the, the hmm. crucial thing is that it's not a usual it's not a usual form. Hmm. I must have some unusual reason, hmm. particular reason. But but it might be that I have um, <clears throat> it might be that I've always thought so and said, said so before. It could be that I was absolutely disgusted about the house being built, for example. <laughs> and, although I have to admit it's actually aesthetically quite attractive, but I'm just adapting wasn't there. All, all sorts of things could have explained this. I mean, there's a, there's a danger of, of over-sophisticated analysis based yeah. on the forms of words. Yes. So it's a very minor point. It doesn't yeah. affect your, mm. your, your talk at all. Thank you. <laughs> I was about to say, hey, yeah. I, 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 I think if I have a rejoinder, it's that uh, there'd be lots and lots of examples um, sh showing this sort of thing going on. But yes, thank you. I think I'll accept that. <laughs> so, yeah. Not a final comment, but actually, some of the things you picked up are really sophisticated achievements if you're learning English as a foreign language. Mm. Because. Um, 
it fucks with my life all the time, Spanish. Because in Spanish, you just say most of those things, you just say, I don't know, that's a noise better now. Now, English, it's, isn't he, doesn't she, haven't we, endlessly, as my ways of body of mind. Um, and I wondered if there was a feed off from what you're doing into the teaching of English as a foreign language. I'm sure there is, but I suppose the problem is uh, these mo interactual moments are so fugitive. And whether you can actually teach someone to say, oh, yes, <laughs> or it is, isn't it? I mean, on the fly, whether the, uh, I mean, I was interested because you mentioned I did some work on actually. Um, I'm interested when I hear it's either put at the beginning or the end of a, 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 a turn. And, and what it does. And I do hear people who've um, spoken English as, as non-native speakers for maybe 20 years using it incredibly accurately. Um, and maybe it's just something that one really picks up. And I, I'm interested in how kids learn, learn this stuff. Because I think um, uh, it would make sense that kids would hear from parents something like it is, isn't it? almost first, <laughs> rather than, yes, it is. I'm not sure. But that's, that's a whole area I, I you know, would, 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 would love to go into, but I, I haven't. It's just impressionistic at the moment. Um, but it's incredibly finessed. This, this thing about, well, the, the, the house example, as I said, it's like someone you know, makes an instant decision to say either, yes, it is, or it is, isn't it? But w w when I started tracking myself doing it, I mean, I, it would just, would just fall out like that. Um, you know, in someone's ha friend's house, um, I admiring a painting of his. That's lovely. It is, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's his, um, and, 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 and it's it's done, and it's done currently, and it's interesting uh, how how people pick up that that's what you do or you don't do. Mm. Well, I think the amount of questions and comments your talk has generated has shown how much we've appreciated it. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to be here. Thank you both very much indeed. Please do come and join us um, if you'd like to continue the conversation. Who knows, you might be providing some data. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't have a microphone in my mouth. <laughs>